Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's live stream. This is AQA Paper 2, one more day of revision, one more evening of revision and you are there and congratulations. I hope you have a great summer afterwards. I will get to Q&A just at the end. There's a couple of questions already. Maybe I'll answer them during the feed anyway. I'm just going to go through all the things I think you need to make sure you memorize tonight uh, and have at the forefront of your memory for that AQA GCC Paper 2. Um, just to say in the uh, description, there is a couple of suggested videos, one of which is the six markers video that we did yesterday. I hope that was really useful, some people around for that. Um, and also last year's paper two, and also the hardest um, bits in the GCSE physics. So I think that if you're all going for the grade nines, I think that's well worth looking at. Hello everybody, and welcome. Hello Anthony, and hello Nia, and uh, Lion Maker fan, awesome, okay. <laughs> Great to have you all here. If you're watching this recorded, then you know, well, you, uh, subscribe and definitely if you're going on to uh, A level, then do go on to subscribe as well. I'm going to try and not get uh, distracted by the chat and I'm going to go straight into the PowerPoint now, which has just all of the kind of key things that I think you need to really just memorize really um, tonight. And uh, I think that, you know, there's not everything in the whole GCC, obviously, but these are kind of set explains. These are ones that come up time and time again. That, that definitely just um, the type of answer that the explain answers that will come up in this paper tomorrow. So just remember, hello, everyone, again, um, just remember, welcome. Um, <laughs> just remember when you're in the paper and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't know anything about this. Um, just calm yourself down and think, what can I apply? to this question. What do I know that I can actually apply to this question? If you're lucky, if you stay around to the end for the Q&A, then I'll tell you a story about Tunisian cows, okay? And it's a, it's a good one. It's about a test paper. And it's one of those kind of things that often come up when they send you something in a paper, which is like a context for something that you do know something about, something that you have that can help you solve it. And one of these decks, one of these things in the, one of these slides will help you solve that. Now, some of them are marked higher, like this one, and some of them are marked triple. So if you're doing combined science, you don't need to worry about this one, for example. So let's get straight into it then. This is about pressure in a column of fluid. There's the equation it's given to you. You just need to select it. It basically says if you double the depth, then you double the pressure. If you double the density, you double the pressure. This is in a column of any fluid, like a liquid or a gas. If you double the gravitational field strength, you double the pressure. Obviously, you can't change that here on Earth. It says pressure is directly proportional to depth. And get that word, directly proportional, into your answers. Pressure is directly proportional to density. Pressure is directly proportional to gravitational field strength. And you need to remember that gravitational field strength is 9.81 um, newtons per kilogram or acceleration be 9.81 meters per second squared and that's on planet earth it would change a different planet okay you need to know about speed and how to work from displacement time graphs now uh, speed is an example of a scalar speed is distance over time and that's the equation but it's written as distance equals speed times time so make sure you memorize that um, examples of scalars which have only have size are mass time speed and distance Vectors have size and they have direction. Okay, so that's the difference between a scalar and a vector. It's a really simple question they often like to ask. For example, force has a direction, acceleration has a direction, velocity, displacement, acceleration. I've written it twice, so good they've written it twice. Um, so anything that can be negative is going to be a vector is one way to think about it. Now on a displacement time graph down here in the um, bottom left of the slide, uh, then the first one, a gradient, would be a constant velocity. So a straight gradient, a um, constant gradient is constant velocity. The second one is actually stopped, okay, because the displacement isn't changing as time goes forward. And three is a constant and it's negative and it's a lower velocity as well because it is uh, less, um, less sloped, it's less steep, so the gradient is lower. Okay, that is um, speed. Now acceleration, there's the equation for it. It's the change in velocity over time. So remember, something can be change in direction um, or speed. And you can still talk about having acceleration. They often ask about things going around in circles. So there's a practical that you need to know about that required practical in AQA. Um, you measure the speed in two places. And an accurate way to do that is to use light gates. It's not the only way to do this practical, but you know, it's one way. And make sure you say what you're measuring with what you're measuring. So you measure the speed in two places using light gates measure the time between those using a stopwatch and then use the equation acceleration is changing velocity over time to give you the acceleration just quote that quote that um, uh, equation basically and now again this is now a velocity time graph so whenever you are looking at a um, 
uh, at a motion graph, make sure you first look at the um, labels on the axes. This one is a velocity time graph. So you're going to deal with it very differently to if it was a displacement time graph. Now, in this case, number one that I've labeled over here is accelerating because its velocity is increasing. Then number two is a constant velocity or constant speed because it is not changing that speed. It's always at this same constant speed. Then three is a negative and lower acceleration because acceleration is the gradient on a velocity time graph. And four, number four is the one that people often forget. The area under the graph is the distance the whole thing has gone, distance the whole thing has gone. So you can split that into triangles and squares or triangles and rectangles and you can work out the area under that graph and that will give you the total distance traveled by the thing. You need to memorize this equation for kinetic energy. Um, e, uh, kinetic energy is half mv squared, half times the mass times the speed squared. I've done a little example calculation down here, but just to say energy stored in something because it's moving. And if you double the speed, you don't just get double the energy, you quadruple the energy. And they often ask you this type of thing, they will say something like, the speed doubles, what happens to the energy? Uh, you know, how does that change the energy? And I like to think it's an important thing for students to, just to remember this rearranged form of the equation. This V is root 2 EK over M. So twice the um, kinetic energy, divide that by mass, and then you've got root, root of that to give you the velocity. Okay, example calculation over here. So if the mass is a quarter of a kilogram and the speed is four meters per second, substitute the numbers in and don't forget to square the four afterwards. And two, two is the answer to this one. Two joules is the unit for energy. Right, let's be moving on. So this is Newton's um, laws on this slide here. And the first um, two laws are really quite similar, okay, which are about resultant forces and acceleration. So first law, Newton's one, N1. If the resultant force is zero, so if the force is a balance, then the acceleration is zero. Not that it won't move, but that it will stay doing whatever motion it was doing. No change in speed or direction, no acceleration. Newton two, Newton's second law, resultant force is proportional to acceleration, and that's the equation, basically. Okay, so the sum of the forces, that's the little sigma up there, resultant force, in other words, the overall effect of the force, the net force, is mass times acceleration. So I've done a free body diagram down here for Newton two, which has one force larger than the other, so there is a resultant force to the right, as I look at it, and I guess you look at it as well, because it's not a mirror. <laughs> um, uh, there's a resultant force to the right, so it accelerates to the right, proportional to the size of that difference in the two forces, that resultant force. Now, Newton's third law, actions have equal and opposite reactions. So for Newton's third law, I've had to draw two bodies. So let's call it body A and body B. Body A does a force on body B, so body B does a force back on body A. And they're both the same size, but they're opposite directions, okay? Now, these are free body diagrams, okay? So you don't need to actually draw the thing. If you have to do a free body diagram, you can just do a dot to represent the body. Remember, we're just talking about the forces on one object, okay? So just think about the individual object, what the forces on it. Um, forces as arrows from the object, not towards it. And the length of those arrows represents the size of the force. Okay, I hope that helps us move on. So momentum next. Everyone's uh, least favorite probably part. Uh, it's just a higher part though, but you do need to know the equation. Mass times velocity. It's the product of mass time, mass and velocity. They might give you an example like this with two cars that are gonna collide and you could work out the momentum before and make that equal to the momentum after. That is the law of conservation of momentum. The momentum before a collision is always exactly the same as the momentum afterwards. So what they might normally do is give you data about the momentum before a collision and you could calculate that, make that equal to the momentum after it and then you give some of the data like maybe one of the masses or uh, say that they're now a combined mass and you calculate the velocity after the collision. Remember to think about velocity being negative. So have one direction be positive and one direction be negative. We normally talk about to the right being positive, to the left being negative, but you don't have to do it that way around. Okay, the equation of uniform motion that you need to apply is uh, V squared equals U squared plus 2ES, or often it's written as V squared minus U squared equals 2ES, which is just the exact same thing. V is final velocity, U is initial velocity, and acceleration is A, and distance is S, because it means space, and we just don't use D, all right? Um, can be applied to situations where acceleration is constant, so only works in situations where acceleration doesn't change. 
so there's a constant result in force on something. For example, a car accelerates uniform from, uniformly from rest, so they might say that if you see the word uniformly, accelerates uniformly, uh, constant acceleration, then think to yourself, I can apply that equation of motion, and you get given it, you don't have to memorize it. Okay. Um, with an acceleration of five meters per second squared, travels 20 meters, calculate its final velocity. So what I would do here is just substitute all the numbers that I've got in from that. So u is zero, put it into the equation. a is five, distance is 20, put it into the equation, and then work out result for v squared, which gives you 200, and then root that to give v, which is 14 meters per second. Hope that makes sense. Okay, now there are some other ones, but you don't need to use them unless you're doing educas in which case, why are you on an AQA stream? But it doesn't matter, well, because I'm not going to do an Educast one. But yes, you, there are some other ones, and you can use them, you can memorize them if you want, the other two just there. But I'd suggest just stick with the one that you get given, because that's all you'll need. Um, okay, road safety is an important part in paper two. So stopping distance, the total, total stopping distance is the thinking distance plus the braking distance. And factors affecting the thinking distance are things which change the reaction time of the driver. So I think, about thinking distance first as being separate from braking distance and they add up to make stopping distance. Okay, so um, things that affect the human's reaction time is gonna be alcohol or drugs, distractions, and that's a really important one for you teenagers. Um, I don't need to get into it now. Tiredness is another one as well. The factors affecting braking distance are things to do with the mechanical car on the or the road right so they're actually about forces the facts affecting braking distance because we use forces to do mechanical work to slow the car down so icy roads or wet um or <laughs> icy roads or wet roads and worn tires worn brakes things like that and just say those things worn tires worn brakes just say thank you very much to joel it's been a great help um for your a level i'm really pleased about that thanks a lot for the super chat buddy all right Great, I'm glad you uh, found the stuff helpful. Okay, um, and good luck, he says, to everyone doing their GCSEs. And they're almost done now, okay? It's almost at the end. This is the last one for many of you, I'm sure. All right, moving back on to this, and thanks again, Joel. Uh, double the speed, double the thinking distance, okay? So that's one thing that you need to remember, because if you're going twice as fast, you react in the same amount of time. Uh, distance is speed times time, so double the speed, you double the thinking distance. But double the speed, you quadruple the braking distance because of the V squared in the kinetic energy equation. So if you double the speed, you've got quadruple the energy. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And you have to dissipate the energy as you brake. Um, so you also need to know about how to estimate some typical speeds. Now, one meter per second is 2.2 miles per hour. Roughly, one meter per second is two miles per hour. So if you're going at 60 miles per hour, roughly, you're going to be 30 meters per second. And a typical car is 1,000 kilograms, about a ton, maybe a little bit more than that if it's a big car, but a small car, like a Ford car or something like that, would be a, be a ton, 1,000 kilograms. And a typical deceleration, if you're just slowing down towards kind of... Um, a traffic lights or something would be like minus two meters per second squared but a typical deceleration in a crash might be like 10 times that so 20 meters per second squared you don't need to remember any of those but what you do need to be able to do is to make some sensible estimations okay now crumple zones and seat belts and helmets all safety features in cars really increase the collision time so therefore reduce the acceleration therefore reduce the force on a on the people inside the car basically so there's less injuries um, you can also talk about that lowers the rate of change of momentum, which is another way of saying Newton's second law, but we'll leave it with that. If you get reduced acceleration, we'll be happy about that. More time, basically. The crumple zone means the collision happens over more time, so the deceleration is lower, so the force is lower. Work done, as you know, is energy transferred mechanically by forces. It's force times distance. Power, as you know as well which you may have to use in this paper too, is the rate of transfer of energy. What was that, sorry? A watt is the unit of power. What, sorry? A joule per second. So power is how much work and how much time a joule per second. Oh, okay. So what is a watt? It, it's a joule per second. Okay, now we're moving on to Hooke's law, and this is a practical you have to do. Hooke's law is force is proportional to extension, and the constant proportionality is this thing, K, the spring constant. So force is proportional to extension is what that equation says. A spring deforms elastically until the limit of proportionality. So that's the, 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 the end of the proportional section of the graph here, the force extension graph, which I've just uncovered because I don't know why it's all covered up at this point, because I did it earlier on and that's, you know, that's what I've done. All right, moving on. Um, and after this, 
you get plastic deformation. So after the limit of proportionality, you get the elastic limit. <laughs> Sorry, Oscar, all right. It's a good joke. It's got legs, that what joke, all right. Um, <laughs> after this, you get plastic deformation after the limit of proportionality or after the uh, elastic limit, which means the change in shape is permanent after you remove the deforming force. So basically in this practical, you add weights to the spring, add a slotted masses, which add weight to the spring. It does a force on it, basically. You measure the extension using a ruler. You can clamp it to make sure it's vertical um, and make sure that zero always stays at the bottom where the, where the spring started. Um, and you plot force on the y-axis and extension on the x. And the reason why you put force on the y-axis is because then the gradient is the spring constant. So the steeper the graph, the stiffer the spring is. Elastic strain energy is an equation that you just need to be able to apply. I think they give it to you. You don't need to memorize it. It's a half times K, which is the spring constant, so how stiff the spring is, times the extension squared. So think about it again, another proportional idea. If you double the extension, you quadruple the elastic strain energy, the energy stored in the spring, basically. Weight and mass, they're different things, okay? Weight is a force due to gravity. You know, it's different because it's measured differently. It's measured in newtons. Um, mass is the amount of matter, and it's measured in kilograms. G is the gravitational field strength, and on Earth, that's 9.81 newtons per kilogram, or roughly 10. So that's coming back again from that very first bit about the... Um, the pressure. Gravitational potential energy is energy stored in something because it's high up in a gravitational field. And that's mass times g times height. Um, pressure is something that is used to explain a simple machine which is hydraulics. Pascal is the unit of pressure. Pa is the unit you can use. Um, and it's newtons per square meter. It explains a simple machine hydraulics. Hydraulics are basically force multipliers. We use them in brakes to you know, mean that we can stop a car with our foot, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Okay, the force is multiplied in the ratio of the areas of the pistons. So the force I put in here is multiplied in the ratio of the two areas. So if this area was one and this was two, then the force would be doubled. If this was 10 and this was 40, then the force would be quadrupled because the ratio would be one to four. So just look at the areas. Now you can actually sum that up by doing a little fraction because we're basically saying that the force, um, sorry, the pressure in the fluid that fills this um, hydraulic system is the same everywhere. And um, you can make the, therefore the pressure on one piston equal to the pressure on the other. F over A for one is equal to F over A on the other. Put all the numbers in, you just have one unknown in a, in a solution like this and therefore you get your final answer. Um, moments also explain simple machines, but two different ones. The principle of moments is when something is balanced, then the clockwise moment equals the anti-clockwise moment. I didn't balance that, did I? Um, and oh, I didn't want to waste my time with that. Um, the principle of moments is when the clockwise moments equals the anti-clockwise moments, and a fulcrum or a seesaw can be said to be balanced. Um, we can explain simple machines levers with this and we can explain gears with this as well. In levers, the force is multiplied in the ratio of the effort distance, which is the long arm, to the load distance. So in other words, if this effort distance is twice the load distance, then the force on the load will be twice the effort. Okay, um, it's really useful for lots of reasons, levers, especially if you're a wily coyote and you're trying to hit a road runner. Um, or get like paint, you know, open a paint jar is the other one that we often talk about painting. Um, gears, force multiplied in the ratio of the diameters. So this time force one is on the, is the input force, if you like, the effort, and the force two is double force one because the diameter of these two cogs are in a ratio one to two. The diameter of the second one is twice that. You can also talk about the number of teeth, but if the teeth are the same size and the diameter is doubled, then the number of teeth is doubled as well. Motor effect, and Rachel will notice that this has been corrected, this slide. Um, thank you very much. You can make these mistakes pretty simply, and, and people like me, who are examiners and teachers, do make mistakes on these things sometimes as well. So the magnetic field around a current carrying wire basically interacts with a permanent magnetic field and produces a force. So this is what I'm saying. These cards, and go through them again, try and memorize them, are just explanations. If they ask you to explain the motor effect, boom, 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 one, two, three, Magnetic field around a current carrying wire interacts with a permanent magnetic field, produces a force. So this is my little diagram there, and you can use Fleming's left-hand rule to um, solve that, okay? Fleming's left-hand rule is thumb is the force, the first finger is the field, and it points from north to south, and the second finger is the current. Now in this case, I have a cross, so I have current going into the screen. 
Uh, as you're looking at, I'm looking at a screen that's just like the one in front of me. Okay, so if you do that with your screen in front of you, you should see the force, the thumb is pointing downwards. Okay, so that's this one over here. Now a DC motor has a split ring commutator and uh, somebody was mentioned talking about these earlier. Now remember a DC motor, so plug into direct current, has a split ring commutator and that's different for an alternator that we're coming on to in a second. And what happens is every half turn, so this is the coil, but we're looking side on so we can just see one current going into the screen and one current coming at us out of the screen, that's the dot. Um, the coil changes the connection every half turn, meaning that the current is always going into the screen on the left and always coming out of the screen on the right. Okay, so current is always the same direction on either side of the magnetic field, meaning the force is always up on one side and always down on the other side, so it continuously rotates. The, now you can work out the size of that force by using this equation, which you don't need to remember, you're given. Uh, force is magnetic field strength times current times length, Fred equals Bill basically, F equals B I L, and it allows you to calculate the size of a force if you know the size of the field strength, double the field strength, double the force, double the current, double the force, double the length of wire in the field, that's length, double the force. So there it's a proportional rule again. You can obviously rearrange that and they often do give you a rearranging of that. Um, electromagnetic induction is when a conductor moves through a magnetic field, so it's kind of the opposite of the motor effect. You've got, instead of having a current causing a force, you've got something moving through a field causing a current. So a PD is induced, a potential difference is induced. Um, so you can write that, you can write potential difference, there's no problem with that. Now an alternator uh, produces this kind of wave, okay, and if you sketch this wave as a definition for um, AC, then make sure that you label it as potential difference versus time. Okay, um, and an alternator has slip rings and a dynamo has split ring commutator. A dynamo produces DC and it's changing DC, it's up and up and up and up and up and up, but it's never negative, so it's always DC. Um, and a dynamo has a split ring commutator, so that's like this, which again, it changes um, connection every half turn meaning that it's always positive, 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 positive. Yeah, definitely useful for Edexcel as well. Somebody just asked that question. Um, slip rings mean that there's a permanent connection and there's two rings basically. One connects to this side. So as it goes around, it as, it, as the coil goes around, it's moving down through the field connected to one side. So it becomes a negative. Okay, moving on. Transformers then everyone, um, everyone's favorite bit. Uh, there's a ratio basically of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the turns is all this equation really says. Again, simple things, right? This is going to be, um, you know, give you three out of these four things and then work out the third. So just make sure you can rearrange that. If, In other words, another way of thinking about it is, is put the numbers in and make sure that um, the two ratios are equal. So whatever you need to do to get from VP to VS, you do to get from MP to NS or, or VP to NP, you have to do to get from VS to NS. Hope that makes sense. Um, basically, always when you explain a transformer, remember just, you know, memorize these explanations and just put them down when it's a kind of simple explain question. You recognize that that's an explanation of transformers. An alternating current, has got to be alternating in the primary coil, causes a changing magnetic field in the core, induces an alternating PD in the secondary. Now, the labels on this, they might ask you to label one, you never know, an iron core, an AC output there is all I've kind of put on there. So that one would be a step up transformer because there are more turns on the secondary than there are on the primary, meaning that the ratio is um, increasing voltages. Why would you want to increase the voltages um, in an, in the national grid setting? Well, you use a step up transformer to before you put the um, electricity into the national grid. And this is called the transformer power equation. It basically says the power on the primary, voltage times current on the primary, is equal to the power on the secondary, voltage times current on the secondary. Uh, step up transformers increase the potential difference. Now, because these two powers are equal in an ideal transformer, a 100% efficient transformer, which doesn't exist, but you know, basically, if we increase the voltage, we decrease the current. Double the voltage, half the current. Why do we reduce the current in transmission wires is to reduce heat loss due to the current. So remember the heating effect of current is a nice big idea in, in physics. And remember this equation as power loss equals I squared R. So I squared R power is the one that we use to explain why we reduce the, um, the current. 
So if you half the current, you've quartered the power loss. If you've done a third of the current, you've got a ninth of the power loss, so a lot less. Makes the whole system more efficient. Then we use step down transformers to reduce the PD so it's safe for users in home and business because if we have a high potential difference then everything would be sparking everywhere. Microphones and loudspeakers are just examples of the motor effect and the generator effect. Okay, So um, think about explaining them as just being the same thing but backwards from each other. So in a um, loudspeaker, an AC signal, so that's a signal like we had the alternating current uh, wave there, causes a coil of wire to move in a magnetic field which causes a sound wave, high pressure and low pressure regions. Now for the first one, left to right, you can read that's how a loudspeaker works. And right to left, well that is how a microphone works. The, um, the sound wave causes a coil of wire to move which causes an AC signal. So they're the same but backwards. So here's the, the microphone. It has a little coil of wire. Well, you can't see on the camera, but anyway, it has a little coil of wire which I'm moving with the sound waves that, that there, and that causes an AC signal, which is then digitized, and you guys can hear it. Anyway, too much detail. Okay, now onto waves. Nice little segue from microphones and loudspeakers into those waves. This is the wave speed equation. It's the most important thing about waves, really. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. You need to memorize it. Wave speed is constant, it's the same in any given medium. So speed of sound in air, speed of light in a vacuum are fixed. Three times 10 to the eight meters per second for speed of light in a vacuum and speed of sound in air at 20 degrees is 343 meters per second. So therefore we can say that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional, double one, half the other. So anywhere on this graph, if I take frequency and wavelength, I multiply them together, I get a constant. That's another way of saying inversely proportional. And that constant is the wave speed, which is fixed in any given medium, anything the wave is travel traveling through. Here are two graphs and they look pretty similar, but one is a displacement versus time graph. And that can show the time period, which is the time for one full wave cycle. And the amplitude can be shown on that as well, which is the height of the wave from the equilibrium position, the center line. The other one is a displacement displacement graph, which shows like a picture of the wave freezed in space. And that can show the wavelength and it can also show the amplitude. So just be aware when you're looking at graphs, you know, which one are you looking at? If they ask you to say, what is this uh, between peak and peak? Are you looking at a displacement time graph? Are you looking at a displacement versus displacement graph, an X versus Y graph? These are two equations that are really useful that just say that frequency and time period are inverse one another. So the frequency is one over the time period and time period is one over the frequency. The frequency, remember, is the last wave quantity to define from here, which is the number of full waves per second. How frequent are the waves? How many waves per second are there? There's a practical where you often use like a ruler in a tray to wobble the water and make a, make a set of waves. You can measure the wavelength using a stroboscope, which is a flashing light, allows you to kind of pause the wave and a ruler, just measure the, the wave from peak to peak to measure the wavelength. You can measure the frequency by counting how many waves there are in 10 seconds. So you time for 10 seconds so that it's more accurate. It's very hard to time just one second accurately because of reaction time time for 10 seconds and you do the number of waves in 10 seconds divide by 10 to give you the frequency as per second. Um, frequency multiplied by wavelength should be a constant and that's really what you're trying out in this practical is just do you get a constant wave speed. And once again that is a massively important equation for you to remember. V is F lambda, wave speed is frequency times wavelength. Sound is an example of a longitudinal wave, which has regions of high pressure and low pressure. Remember when you're describing longitudinal waves that you have oscillations or vibrations parallel to the direction of wave energy transfer. Okay, oscillation and wave are two different things. The wave is moving along, the oscillation is just backwards and forwards on the spot in this case. So oscillation is parallel to the direction of wave energy transfer. This is reached as a set of high pressure and low pressure. The human range of hearing is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Sound can be used for echolocation, uh, for example, for ultrasound scanners, sonar, and by animals like bats and dolphins. And when you're given something like echolocation, don't forget that we're often talking about the time for the pulse to get there and back. So remember, you can use it to calculate distance um, with, if you know the speed as well. And don't forget to divide the time by two if we're just trying to work out the distance there. 
Okay, next one. Light is an example of a transverse wave. Transverse wave have oscillations which are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. So this oscillation is up and down whilst the energy is along. So the wave is moving along and the light, the uh, oscillation on the electromagnetic field is perpendicular at right angles to that. It's a continuous spectrum of electromagnetic radiation light, okay? And it's increasing towards the ionizing portion. So UV, X-rays, and gamma are what we call the ionizing portion. So you need to make sure you remember them all in order. I don't even think I've written them on here because I presume you do. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that's visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma. Higher frequency, higher energy. So gamma has the highest energy. Higher frequency, lower wavelength, highest energy, remember they all have 3 times 10 to the 8 as their speed. Okay, optics is an important, um, I think really interesting bit, I love teaching the optics bit. Remember waves, optics is all about diff, uh, refracting light basically, okay. Uh, waves refract because their speed changes when they move from one medium to another. So I've got two diagrams of the eye here, this is for a short sighted person, the um, light is actually focusing before the retina so that's an issue you can remember that as diagram just being the light focuses short of the retina and short sighted people find it difficult to see in focus things that are really far away long sight has the light not focusing at all on the retina because the focus will be behind the retina it's too long so just remember it like that and that um they will have trouble uh, seeing things that are really close to their face so I, for example, have short sight and I have to correct that by using uh, diverging lenses. Long sighted eyes, excuse my baby Florence there. Uh, long sighted eyes have rays focusing behind the retina and they're corrected by converging lenses or convex lenses. Okay, um, there's a practical in to do with uh, the refraction of light that you need to know about. Always remember to construct a normal line before you measure your angles. So these, these dotted lines are what you call normals. They are at right angles, 90 degrees to a surface or a boundary. Whether it's reflection or refraction, you always measure between a ray and a normal. So I've labeled I the angle of incidence there and R the angle of refraction there as well. Uh, you measure the angle of instance, don't forget to say what you measure stuff with, with a protractor. You measure the angle of refraction with a protractor. It's important to make sure you say what you are measuring stuff with in your GCSE physics. Um, this is for AQA that you need to know. Um, the magnification is just the ratio of image height over object height. So if the image is twice the size of the object, then you'd have a magnification of times two. If it was half the size, you'd have a magnification of a half. Ray diagrams are really, really easy as long as you follow this simple recipe. They're really confusing if you don't. So you'd be given a ray diagram like these with everything, um, everything drawn on apart from one, two, three, and the image. Okay, so you just need to remember how to do step one, two, and three. So step one is draw a ray from the top of the object all the way over to the middle of the lens parallel to the axis of the lens. So line up your ruler, it'd be on graph paper probably, so use the graph paper parallel to the axis to the middle. Then refract that ray through the principal focus and with a converging lens you use the far principal focus, the one on the other side of the lens. Then, and you always do this, this ray all uh, from the top through the very center, the optical center of the lens. And where those two rays cross is the top of the image. Okay, so that, so that would be a dotted line and we could label that the image. But the top of it, if it was an image of a tree, that'd be the where the leaves are basically. Now a diverging lens um, is slightly different because the diverging actually acts to spread the light out from a point. Now, which direction does it go? You just line it up with the other principal focus. And you, with a diverging lens, you use the principal focus before the um, the lens. Okay, um, so you can see the light. Step one is exactly the same: ray parallel to the axis, to the middle. Step two is similar. You've refracted it, but it's going out. So you use up the line. You use the the uh, behind focus to line up where that goes and step three is exactly the same and step four is exactly the same where the rays cross is the top of the image okay, this is now a virtual image so let's talk about describing them quickly this image with the converging lens is inverted it's real and it's um, diminished it's smaller than the object this image is upright it's virtual and it is also diminished 
a virtual uh, image is just something, if I put a screen there where the image is, I wouldn't get that image on the screen because there's no light actually going to that point. Okay, seismology is about waves. Okay, that's about understanding our planet Earth. P waves are called pressure waves as they're longitudinal. They're also called primary waves because they're faster than secondary waves. So longitudinal waves, they're, they're the warning shake left to right on the land. Um, S waves are often called surface waves as they're transverse. So imagine a wave on the surface of something. They're often called secondary waves as they're slower than primary waves. So they get their second and they do all the damage. We know that the earth has a solid mantle liquid outer core. Oh, sorry, sorry, excuse me. The earth has a solid mantle, a liquid outer core, and a solid inner core. Okay, why do, why do we know that? Because S waves don't travel through liquids, and so they leave a shadow on the far side of the earth. Okay, I wish I had a little diagram here, but basically, they, you can just remember this. S waves don't go through liquids, they leave a shadow on the far side of the earth. P waves are refracted as they go through the um, boundary between the mantle and the outer core, and so they leave two shadows on the far side of the earth. Okay, um, space now for triple. So this is about the Big Bang Theory and Hubble's experiment. The Big Bang Theory is just that the universe expanded from a single point, singularity. Edwin Hubble, what he did was he measured speed that galaxies are moving away from us. That's this y-axis here. And he also measured um, the distance from Earth. How did he measure it? He, he measured it using redshift. A redshift is about comparing light from a stationary source with light that comes from something that's receding, it's moving away from us. Now he found that all of the galaxies were redshifted, so they were all moving away from us. And that the further away they were, the faster they were moving away. So the conclusion to that is that the universe is expanding. Now just look at these two sets of lines. They're both the same, but one is shifted to the higher wavelength end. That means the red end of the spectrum, the low energy end of the spectrum. So that is red shift. So if something is red shifted, it's moving away from us. The more it's red shifted, the faster it's moving away from us. There's one more bit of evidence that is about um, CMBR. It's about the final bit of evidence from everywhere in the universe. We get this same signal, this cosmic microwave background radiation, CMBR you can write, uh, which comes from everywhere. So everywhere has the same signal. So this is evidence for everywhere having started at the same point. Everywhere's got the same signal, so everywhere started at the same point. It's confirmation of the Big Bang over, let's say, the steady state theory. Uh, theory. Last couple of slides now, three more to go. Um, stellar evolution, which is the life cycle of stars. Oh, just to say really quickly, you need to know about some objects in our solar system in from smallest to largest comets, dwarf planets, moons, planets, and the sun. Incidentally, Pluto's been upgraded again. You know, we don't need to get into that. Um, uh, the stellar evolution is the life cycle of stars, basically. Okay, so it all starts from a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust, which contracts due to the force of gravity. You need that detail in there. Gravity brings the gas and dust together. Then you get a protostar, where you get friction, and that causes high temperature and pressure. When you get high temperature and pressure, you can get fusion. Fusion is hydrogen and hydrogen coming together to make helium. Then you get a main sequence star, which is the stable period of a life. It's the main part of the life. It's the main sequence. Um, during which force, due to that radiation pressure outwards and gravity force inwards, are balanced. For a sun-like star, so a star with not a great deal of mass, basically, it's, it's eventually going to run out of um, hydrogen and it's going to cool down and it's going to expand. Um, and we're making extra elements at this point. We're doing helium fusion, helium and helium into whatever number four is the period table. But we're making things up to iron, but no more than iron. Um, and then you get after that, you get a white dwarf and a planetary nebula. And that's when the outer layers of the red giant just expand out, drift out into space, we often say. And last fusion occurs until all the hydrogen runs out and the white dwarf will eventually become a brown dwarf and no more fusion, no more light. Okay, moving on for number five, that is a massive star now. So when you've got a star much, much more mass than, than the our star, the sun, uh, then you get a red supergiant, so something much, much, much larger. It's Again, it's expanding and cooling as the um, hydrogen runs out. Again, it's making heavier elements, but it's got enough mass to collapse in on itself on the dense core and produce an explosion in which elements more more massive than iron are made. So there's extra energy available during that massive explosion, that supernova, where heavy elements are made. 
after that you can get a neutron star which is just a very dense ball of it should say neutrons i apologize or a black hole if there is enough um mass and a black hole is an object that's so dense that not even light can escape its gravity field so that's why it's black satellites gravity acts as a centripetal force which is a force towards the center of an orbit and keeps satellites orbiting earth this causes a change in direction so if you get a change in direction you've got a change in velocity so that it's accelerating geostationary orbits are at the same point above the equator and have an orbital period of 24 hours so they're always exactly the same point uh, position in the sky so we don't have to move our satellite dish it's if you've got a satellite tv that's the type of satellite it's looking at um, they're used for communication and broadcasting because we don't have to orientate our satellite dish. We need constant line of sight. Um, low polar orbits go over the poles of the Earth. So if geostationaries are quite high and they go around the Earth, around the equator, then low polar orbits are over the poles of the Earth. They have a much shorter orbital period, which is only about you know somewhere up to two hours. And they're used for observation of Earth and they're used for spying, maybe they're used for weather forecasting, that type of thing. Um, now, the thing to remember about orbits, just think about it like this, is the way people like to understand it, is every height above Earth has a certain speed at which the travel light, um, the travel light, the satellite travels such that as it falls to Earth, Earth falls away from it at the same rate. So if it's going too fast, then it will spiral away from Earth. If it's going too slow, it will spiral towards Earth. Okay. Um, this is our last slide. So radiation and temperature, okay, is that um, all bodies emit um, EM radiation and that the higher the temperature the body is, the higher the intensity will be of all that radiation. So more radiation given out, more EM radiation, more photons given out, more light. Um, the higher, and also the higher the frequency as well. So hotter, higher frequency, therefore, those stars, those objects in the universe, they look bluer, okay? Lower temperature emits lower frequency, so longer wavelength, so though those stars, those objects appear redder. Now don't confuse that with redshift. It's not about it being shifted because it's moving, but it's about it actually emitting redder light because it's cooler, so hence red giant. Um, and lastly, about radiation temperature, the greenhouse effect, basically, um, Earth's atmosphere transmits high frequency light. So from the sun, we get all this light, including the high frequency stuff, the UV, that all gets absorbed by Earth and is re-emitted as infrared. Infrared is reflected by the atmosphere. So in other words, that infrared heat is trapped in our atmosphere. And um, that's the greenhouse effect. The, the atmosphere heats up because of that. Now that's fine. That's the way it should work at a certain stable kind of rate. But we are increasing the rate of greenhouse effect by putting carbon into the atmosphere so that leads to global warming um, and yes it is Donald it's a reproducible finding so it is something that many scientists have done many experiments into and they've all come with the same conclusion that carbon um, pollutants increases the rate of the greenhouse effect and that is everything that's all I hope that was really useful as I said, I'd do a quick q and um, I'm going to have to go pretty soon, though, because I'm going to come back with a uh, OCR Gateway one in a minute. Somebody was asking, is that useful uh, for Edexcel? I'm sure it is, but just be aware of what is and isn't on your paper. Possibly if you watch the OCR one later, some of the things, uh, other things that maybe it wasn't in that bit will be coming up for yours as well. OCR has got energy that that didn't have and OCR has the um, nuclear stuff that, that didn't have as well. I hope I answered your question about the slip rings and the, um, and the uh, brushes as well for commutators, commutators and um, uh, alternators and things, okay, generators. Uh, can you explain why a generator effect is induced to PD creative, no current is always flowing through the wire, surely you need a current to interact with the magnetic field moving and out. So in the generator effect we always say induces a PD rather than a current, but then the, the PD causes a current, the potential difference then can cause a current. So we induce a PD and that PD then can cause a current. Um, is this true about a transformer, Mr. Testosterone? <laughs> Mr. Testosterone says, is this true about a transformer? Alternating current in primary coil sets up an alternating magnetic field in the iron core, which keeps an alternate, induces an alternating voltage in the secondary coil. That is perfect. That is a perfect free mark answer if they ever asked you 
to explain Transformers, then that would be it. Yeah, doing a Q&A now, Majid, if you're interested. Is um, I think somebody's getting confused with A-Level. No, it's, it is your last paper for many of you. How many of you is your last paper tomorrow? Just tell me. I'm not going to do predictions because I just um, haven't even given it any thought. Just revise it all. You know, the, if it's not going to come in a big one, it'll come up in a single mark or something. Test is going to be easy, says John. Okay, good luck, buddy. Okay, hope it goes well. What's a hypernova? It's a really big supernova, basically. Um, I have my year 10 science marks. Okay, hope it goes well for you as well in year 10. I hope you're subbed up as well so you see this stuff in your year 11. Uh, Gamer says, hope you all pass. Um, Rachel's given me a big thank you. Thanks for your help over the last 12 months. Daily revision questions were definitely the best. That's good. I'm, I'm going to bring those back. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate that. Good luck with the new job and good luck to everyone tomorrow. That's great. Rachel, you're going to bang it. Thanks very much for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, don't underestimate how much I appreciate the people that spend time with me here on my channel. Uh, otherwise, I'd just be sitting talking to myself. I'd just... <laughs> Okay, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go cry myself to sleep and fail. No, you're not, gamer. Yeah, you just remember what you do know. Pythagoras is only using A level physics for finding about forces. Now, they could ask you to do Pythag. They could ask you to do Pythag and Trig. Um, yeah, it's my last one. Thanks, Sheridan. Uh, somebody says. Um, yep, yeah, last one. I have additional maths paper next week as well. Hope that goes well for you, buddy. So, yeah, further maths, gang, we'll be doing one more. I think there's some computer science kicking around as well. What if I predict the topic five practical question? Be it no idea, buddy. Um, probably the refraction one, I guess. I'm not just not sure. Um, can you explain how waves change from deep water to shallow water on the other way around? So yeah, do you remember me saying that waves have a speed which is dependent on the medium? Well, in waves in water, then the medium is the depth, basically, the, the, it's the water. But the deeper the, the water is, the faster the waves go. So when it slows down in shallow water, then it will refract. It will, the wave will change direction if, it, if it's going at an angle into the sh shallow water. Electromagnetic induction explanation, please. I think, John Bob, I think I've gone through that. Some people were asking for stuff that I did, you know, to go through waves. Well, I did go through waves, so I'm just going to ask you to go back through that. But if you want more wave stuff, then that is going to come up in the OCR gateway one. Optical density just means um, how hard it, light finds to um, get through something. So if something is slower, it, it will be because it has a higher optical density. Okay, um, if you do have any more, then why not come back at the end of the OCR one? I'm going to go through the OCR one. I'm probably going to take myself 10 minutes now. Um, and then the OCR one will go through some of those stuff as well. Some of it you might want to skip. Um, and yeah, small shots. I'll talk about the... In fact, I talked about the light intensity wavelength graph yesterday. So if you go into the description, look at the six marker. There's a bit in that where I talk about intensity and those um, what we call Wine's Law curves or black body curves. Um, and just keep it really, really simple. Basically, hotter objects, bluer light, higher intensity, higher frequency light given out. Um, I was just finishing a question and got distracted by something else. Yeah, so stick around and ask more questions later if you want. In Newton's first law, how can a moving object have a resultant force of zero when it needs an overall driving force to move? So the point is, we're still driving it, but we also have the resistive forces of friction and air resistance. So we're still putting in extra energy, actually, but we're doing a force forward from the engine, and that is being balanced by a force backwards due to the resistive forces. Rally and Jean's model, uh, not for GCSE. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much, Patricia. Okay. Uh, what quite, uh, type of questions could be used in the Fleming's left-hand rule? Mostly, if it's Fleming's left-hand rule, it's going to be deciding a force if they've given you a field and a current, but it could be deciding a current from a force. It could be as simple as um, just, you know, if I change the direction of the, of the current, what happens to the direction of the force? It could be as simple as that. Could you explain a bit about the ring that is in the motor effect and what it really is? So, yeah, so the motors have split rings. So every single time the motor, um, the coil changes to the other like half a turn, if every single time it does half a turn, it connects to the other side of the circuit. So on the left and the right hand side of the motor, the current is always the same direction. So on the left, it's always in and the right, it's always out, for example. And that means the force stays the same direction, so it goes around. Um, Ulster, if you, I'm gonna have to go now because some people will be waiting for the OCR, but if you wanna ask that question later on, then, um, then do. Uh, just to say, I do have a good video on the motor effect um, and uh, 
there is loads of good videos out there lots of i've got some good videos on resolving forces as well i hope tomorrow's paper is easy for you all as well but don't worry about it just do your best Take your time, maybe rewatch this stuff, get your memory in order, get your set explanations ready to go. Just think, I'm going to apply my understanding of this. I'm going to think about the areas of the syllabus and apply that to this um, question. And I'm just going to use that same language that my teacher uses, that Kit uses on Guerrilla Physics. Those are the things that the marks are going to be for. Okay, my pleasure, uh, yes, Vanti. I'm absolutely glad to help. And um, I will see you all later. I'll be back in a few minutes. But for OCR stuff, I'm going to whiz through some OCR stuff. And I uh, definitely recommend A-level in physics. And then you can ask more questions at the end of that if you like. All right. See you later, everyone.